कृष्णाय वासुदेवाय हरे परमात्मने प्रणतक्लेशनाशाय गोविंदाय नमो नम आई वॉन्ट टू कम टू एनवायरमेंट कॉन्शियसनेस वाई आर कंफ्लिक्ट अवॉइडेंस एंड आई वॉन्ट कैन बी रियली अवॉइड द कंफ्लिक्ट हिस्टोरिकली कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इज अ मेजर फोर्स और इम्पेटस बिहाइंड all our modern developments scientific technological economic all these innovations and advancements including the lifestyles fashions movies entertainment they are all by product of the conflict machinery called the military establishments and that is a brute fact and that world is which is in the conflict situation uh, that world welcomes the conflict situation very much if that is not there what shall we do on the other hand conflict whether it is economic ecological political military cultural etc it also provides a context for the need to dialogue and that is a moment when we disagree with the other however disagree we with the other still we agree to talk and to listen then while sticking to our ideology ideologies and guns we evolve towards some common ground of understanding of the basic universal truths we indians for a long time had the privilege of welcoming variety of sorts and along with that ideologies and cultures and that encounter enabled us to develop a discourse which proclaims vade vade jayate tattva bodha ekam sad vipra bodha vadanti ano badra kratvo yantu vishvata etc etc it did not happen in a vacuum it was a historical context and for enabling such discourse to be fruitful what guru murti has emphasized in his launching his speech we have consensus about the importance and urgency of dialogue between religions not only in the indian context but globally it is significant that the first cousins hindus and the buddhists should talk to each other and today as a part of the emerging discourse rightfully emphasized uh, by the previous speakers i speak to you from a hindu perspective which is inspired by chaitanya mahaprabhu who is the forefather or the promulgator of a global hindu faith called iskon worldwide a version of hindu leader believed to be an incarnation of krishna and radha i introduce chaitanya mahaprabhu also as a prachanna baudha because his whole philosophical discourse he prefers epistemological concept of advaya of nagarjuna while rejecting the metaphysical advaita of shankara it is a very path breaking thing in the whole domain of vedantic tradition although he is a chintya bheda ved vedanta his main religious practice sankirtana will not be there if the buddhist chants are not there if the doha kosh of sarah pad is not there the padavali kirtan will not emerge which is a big thing of contribution of chaitanya and if the kal chakra is not there then all the sanji rituals of the chaitanya temples will be colorless and ritualless and in the 16th century he was the one who opened the doors of hinduism back for thousands and thousand of nedas and nedis they shaven head buddhist monks so among the various important things on his deeds one was the discovery of brindavan the holy play grounds of krishna in 1515 and today i share with you a story of brindavan Vedas, Puranas, poets, musicians, painters, performers, 
they are all for uh, describing Brindavan as the most celestial garden ever possible on earth, okay? So it could have Lior, the Supreme Lord, enjoying his heavens. He thought, let me go to Brindavan and enjoy more than the heavens and Vaikuntha. And it is documented that some 5,000 5, years back when Krishna incarnated in Braj Brindavan, he was shocked to find that nothing in its environment matches the glorious descriptions. God resolved that never again to trust the promotional tourist literature. <laughs> in Brindavan, everything was upside down. Everything was upside down. If we were in Krishna's situation, would we even spend a minute and take our backpack there in that mess, terrible mess? I would not, to be honest. But Krishna is Krishna. He said that it is his decision to come to Braj and Vrindavan and did not get what he wanted. He resolved to get what he did not get. Krishna soon realized that nature, the prakriti, needs to be cared and served, not exploited. And playfully, Krishna worked hard. Playfully, he worked hard to serve and make environment healthy again. And the mother nature danced happily to Krishna's flute. But soon he realized that natural ecology cannot be sustained if the economic system is not healthy. The urban market economy of the tyrant rulers was thriving at the cost of producers, especially the farmers. Krishna enforced a Gandhian principle. Krishna is the first student of Gandhi. A producer should have the first right to use or consume the products. Only the surplus should go to the markets. This ban encouraged smuggling to the luring markets. Krishna enforced the hefty duty on export rigorously and made exports unviable. All illegal consignments were confiscated and destroyed, the destruction of the milk pots. Now, it was the farmer and producer who controlled the market. With that economic strength, Krishna took the political power head on, replacing the tyrant ruler Kansa with the popular and pious ruler Ugrasena. How did he do all this? Krishna believed that in any ecological concern, the crucial thing is a relationship with our environment, whether it is nature or society. That relation can be sustained only through service, which is bhakti, which will not bear fruit if it is done under compulsion or for mere show off. Service has to be with love and care. If we relate out of love, then the interest and well-being of the loved one will be our priority. Else, the relationship is reduced to exploitation which is the root cause of any kind of ecological disturbance. That exploitation has many forms and worst manifestation is in the name of religion. The revolutionary environmentalist Krishna is at his best when on the issue of getting water, he replaces the water god Indra, the intangible high god of Vedic tradition and ritualism with the worship of Mount Govardhan, trees and cows. And he established the tangible green god for the first time in the religious domain. Intriguingly, Krishna installs Brinda, the basil, the tulsi plant, a small plant to be the presiding deity of Brindavan. That's why it is Brindavan. And it becomes Brinda Devi. Because in the realm of love, the most weak and vulnerable is the most powerful because there is no give and take possible. Yamuna, the river, is Krishna's choicest consort throughout his life, whether in Braj, Mathura, or Dwarika. All these acts of Krishna are amazing. But why did he do that? First of all, it was a conscious decision on his part of Krishna not to flee the chaotic and polluted environment. He had an inkling of the bad situation already. 
While contemplating descent on earth, the Paramapurusha Krishna, he heeded the advice of Dr. Maas. You know, when she said, love the woman. He says, Janishyate Priyartham. I am taking descent on this earth to serve my darling. And who is Krishna's darling? Prakriti. Purush has only one darling, that is Prakriti. Prakriti means nature and also it means woman. His respect for the dignity of womanhood is fully manifest when he releases or uh, rescues, you know, uh, physically violated thousands of women. And when those women feel that they are the social waste, he says, you are not social waste, you are my legitimate queens of Dwarika. So there were more to say, but I will just come up. There was uh, the story of Chaitanya, uh, which was I wanted to bring, and it is all circulated to you. But summing up, we need to reflect upon the fact that environment is not just the natural physical world. If we use the proper word for that, Paryavaran, Paryavaran, it is our all round protective cover. And people have highlighted that very much. Natural, physical, political, economic, and cultural environment, they are all linked to each other. Environment in itself bears no meaning unless it is related to the living beings. And especially in the Hindu context, where they say, Shabar upre tahar upre nai. That human truth is supreme. Human well-being to begin with. And that holistic ecological consciousness is what is available to us from Krishna to Bhagavan Buddha, from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Mahatma Gandhi. Chaitanya's way, which is elaborated in my paper, summarizes that consciousness which takes us into a relationship of joy and celebration, not exploitation of the environment, and then protection of that relationship with the loving service, Prema Bhakti. He declares that without service, our world will not exist. Bhakti vina jagatera nahi avasthan. To translate this environment consciousness into action, that is the key, that is the billion dollar question. We all have the awareness, we have the knowledge systems, but how do we translate into action? Manasa, vacha is fine, but how do we land into the karmana domain then? How do we translate that? Like biodiversity, and Guru Murthy says theodiversity, what we at most require is a logical diversity. Logical diversity. That is the most urgent requirement for us to bring our thought process into action. We have to graduate from the either or logic of the binary opposites. We thank Aristotle for that. But we have to graduate and West has tried to free itself from that shackles of either or. Thanks to Button Russell or Whitehead when they started talking about the multipolar uh, logical systems. And if we move from that either or uh, prison, which is the mother of all conflicts and environmental disasters, what we require is a paradigm shift in our own thought process. Chaitanya says that we cannot and should not negate the other, rather engage with it dialogically into a dalliance which transcends the duality without negating it. In the dance of love, the seemingly different entities like men and women, humanity and nature, economy and ecology make one whole. I agree that history alone is not enough to strengthen our desired discourse. However, this story of Vrindavan hopefully is helpful in our discourse. The wisdom down will help us to act. As we say, resolve, talk, and then act. Thank you very much. Pranam.